Thank you very much, Shirelle. It's uh, it's really nice to be here and to see all of you. And you know, during a very difficult time, no doubt. Um, so you know, I think sometimes the the uh, the hachamim and the geonim, the the rabbis and the sages of past times, they used to say when things are challenging now, it's a good time to look at the past, and you can find some consolation, maybe even inspiration. Um, in the past. Um, so I want to share with you today a little bit about the history of Jews in the Ottoman Empire and specifically Sephardic Jews in the Ottoman Empire. And the relevance of this topic for what is going on today is that while we don't always think about it like that, um, Jerusalem and the land of Israel was part of the Ottoman Empire for 400 years, from 1517 until 1917. So what I'm going to be talking about today in the context of Jewish life in the Ottoman Empire, it applies also to Eretz Israel in, uh, in a variety of ways, although each locale uh, within the Ottoman Empire had its own particular dynamics and own particular um, uh, configurations of communities and politics and power, but within the broader framework of the Ottoman Empire. And um, so just, just to have that in the back of your mind as we go through the uh, the history of Jews in the Ottoman Empire um, over the last several centuries. What I'm going to do, if you just permit me one second, is um, to share my screen here. Okay, can you see that? Yes, okay, great. So the, pardon me, the title of my presentation today is Under the Wings of the Sultan, the Rise of Jewish Communities in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about these images in a moment, but I wanted really to begin um, with a map to orient ourselves. So you may recall, of course, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, uh, the uh, conquest of the Americas began, and the subordination of the indigenous populations also began at that time. But also what transpired in 1492 was the expulsion by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of the important Jewish community, communities from uh, what we now would call Spain. Uh, and many of those Jewish communities uh, dispersed across the Mediterranean world, as you can see here in, uh, in the map, um, going toward North Africa, toward Italy, but the vast majority wound up settling in the lands of what was then the Ottoman Empire. And you can see there in the yellow how vast the territories of the Ottoman Empire were. So it included all of the Balkans, Turkey, a big chunk of the Middle East, eventually including um, uh, Eretz Israel after 1517, and also portions of North Africa. And from this period um, of the 15th century, really until the 19th century, when the borders really begin to shrink the, within the Ottoman Empire, Jews residing in the Eastern Mediterranean world were largely connected through a shared political culture within the boundaries of the Ottoman Empire. So if you were living in Sarajevo or Salonika or Istanbul or Cairo or Gaza, and we're going to talk about Gaza actually in a minute, there was a, an important Jewish community in Gaza at one time, you could move between these different regions and you were moving within your own country, within your own empire. So just to have that framework in mind, the vast geography that linked Jews in the Eastern Mediterranean world, in a world that was governed by the principles of Islam. And what's fascinating and maybe a little bit uh, unexpected from today's expectations was that living in a Muslim society was attractive for Jews in this era because the expulsion and the inquisition in Spain was widely perceived by Jews as uh, as a series of acts of persecution, whereas the Ottoman Empire was willing to receive as refugees within the context of a society governed by 
uh, by Sunni Islam, Jews. And we can see this playing out even in the way in which Jews from Salonika, which would become the largest of the Jewish communities in the Ottoman Empire, would conceptualize and actually advertise the Ottoman Empire to other Jews. So here they write to Jews in the south of France saying, hey, you guys should also come here to the Ottoman Empire. And they explain why. The Ottoman Empire is entirely open to you. Settle here, our brethren, in the best of the land. The poor and needy, however, who do not possess any resources will find here a place where their feet can rest and they will be able to exercise a suitable profession. They will suffer neither hunger nor thirst. They will not be afflicted by the burning fire of oppression and of exile because the Lord has bestowed upon us his mercy and he has made us find favor, grace, and pity in the eyes of the nations in the midst of which we are living to such a degree that it would almost be proper to give us a new name and call us captives ransomed by the Lord, because the Turks do not let us suffer any evil or oppression. I mean, that's pretty high, uh, high praise there for the Ottoman state, right? What what is it offering according to this group of Jews in Salonika in the middle of the 16th century? You will have opportunities here. You will not be persecuted. Um, you will be able to live where you want. You will be able to find work. And it's almost as if uh, you will not be in exile anymore, even if you don't settle in the land of Israel itself. But if you settle in some other place within the Ottoman Empire, it's as if you will no longer be in exile. You will be able to develop a place that you can call home within the framework of the Ottoman world. And that's really a fascinating dynamic. And it would set up a framework over the course of the subsequent centuries that would largely enable Jews to live relatively in peace within the framework of the Ottoman Empire. Now, when Jews arrive in the Ottoman Empire from Spain, they're actually joining Jewish communities that were already existing in the Eastern Mediterranean world. There are two communities that I want to point out in particular, perhaps three I'll mention briefly. The first are the Romanio Jews. These are the long-standing Greek-speaking Jews that had been present in the Balkans and in Anatolia since ancient Roman times. That's why they are called Romanio Jews, and they uh, continued to live within the region, never left, and they continued to speak Greek through the Byzantine era into the Ottoman period. And when the, the Jews from the Iberian Peninsula arrive, most of the Greek-speaking communities are assimilated into the new dominant um, Iberian Jewish communities, with the exception of a few places, the most important being right here in central Greece, Yanina, which until the 20th century was comprised of a Greek-speaking community. Now, the second community that I want to mention are the Mustarabin, the Arabic-speaking Jews of the Arabic-speaking provinces of the Ottoman Empire, who also um, have in their own historical memory, having lived within the region essentially since the, in some, uh, according to some legends, since the time of the destruction of the first temple, but certainly since the destruction of the second temple uh, and the development development and spread of Islam and Arabic culture and civilization, Jews have been deeply embedded in this region here, um, as speaking the Arabic language and embedded in the broader Arabic cultural environment. So I'm talking about the Jews of present day uh, Iraq and Syria, although there are very few Jews living in those countries today. At one time, there were very important Jewish communities there who were Arabic speaking. Um, there were no Spanish Jews, essentially, who wound up settling in the provinces, the province of Iraq, but there were um, Spanish Jews who wound up settling in the area of the land of Israel and Syria, and that would become a kind of a mixed and multifaceted and very dynamic set of communities as well, who would be joined by yet a uh, fourth community, if we can say the Romanio Jews, the Arabic-speaking Jews, the Spanish Jews, and then the Ashkenazi Jews. There were Ashkenazi Jews moving from Eastern and Central Europe throughout the Ottoman Empire, um, throughout its existence, and even before. And we'll see that in a, in a moment. So the Ottoman Empire 
while the dominant group became Sephardic Jews of Iberian origin in many ways, certainly in the Balkans and what is now Turkey, th this was a space of the convergence and the meeting of many different Jewish communities who were all able to operate within the framework of the Ottoman Empire. Now, one of the other things that the Ottoman state did was it moved Jews around. So when the Ottoman state would conquer a new terrain, it would take Jews from one place and settle them in the new place. So this contributed more to the mixity and the dislocation, but also the relocation and the reestablishment of Jewish communities all throughout the region. So, for example, when Istanbul, Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, was conquered by the Ottomans in 1453, what did the Sultan do? He brought a group of Jews from Salonika, Greek-speaking Jews, from Salonika, which had been captured by the Ottomans previously in 1430, and relocated them to Istanbul, okay, where they were trying to rebuild the city in the wake of its sack by the Ottomans, and, and, and Jews were perceived as a useful element for the building up of urban societies because of the professions that they played, because of the slightly higher generally level of literacy that they had than some of their neighboring communities. And so you can see um, Jews in particular, but also other populations moved around as part of a policy of surgun um, or uh, uh, relocation, deportation, you might also call it. Um, to build up Jewish communities in the region. So, for example, again, when Rhodes is conquered from the Knights of Malta, right here by the Ottomans, again, this is in the 1520s, another group of Jews from Salonika are brought to the island of Rhodes, which also results in there being important family linkages across the geography of the Ottoman Empire. Within the Ottoman framework, Jews as well as Christians were able to live relatively peaceably as Dimi. And this is a contested term in the history. It's been highly politicized. But the basic framework of Vimi is that the Vimi status was available to uh, non-Muslim monotheists who were recognized by the Ottoman state, according to the Ottoman state's interpretation of Islam, as a protected people. And this applied to uh, Jews, it applied to Orthodox Christians, it applied to Armenians, being the largest of the populations. Um, what's interesting is the most persecuted population in the Ottoman Empire during its early centuries were actually a group you might not expect. They were Shia Muslims. There was no space in the Ottoman Empire for Shia Muslims who were recognized as a heretical sect and affiliated with and associated with the neighboring enemies of the Ottomans, which were the Persian, the Persian Empire. So uh, of all the communities residing in or, or at the margins of the Ottoman Empire, in many ways, it was the Shia Muslims who were, had no space for them within the framework of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so how did this Avimi dynamic work? This was a universe in which there were absolutely no concept of equal rights. There was no concept of equal rights anywhere in the world, and there was no concept of citizenship. So we're speaking about differing levels of privilege and differing uh, relationships to power. So essentially, um, the non-Muslim communities had to pay a special tax that recognized their inferior status vis-a-vis -vis Islam, but that in exchange for that tax, known as the jizya, the, the Jewish communities and the Armenian and Orthodox Christian communities were able to develop their own institutions, their own synagogues, speak their own language, develop their own neighborhoods and institutions. And as long as they paid this tax, they did not rebel and they recognized their position within the empire. They could live um, with a degree of autonomy, self-governance and security. And so this was, again, one of the relatively um, attractive aspects of the Ottoman environment, which was not subjected to expulsions from Jews. So, you know, by the time we arrive at 1492, there are essentially no Jews living in Christian Europe. They had already been expelled from England in 1290, later by France, later by Germany and, uh, and Hungary. 
the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492 and then the forced conversion of Jews in Portugal in 1496 spelled the end of organized official Jewish life in Western Europe until essentially the 17th century. So the, the, the centers of Jewish life moved to the east, to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the context of Ashkenazi Jews, and here to the Mediterranean world in the context of Sephardic Jews. One of the most interesting aspects of the ways that um, Jews in the Ottoman Empire found a niche for themselves after the expulsion from Spain was in, in serving certain kinds of roles. So here you can see on the left, a uh, physician Jew, so a Jewish physician, a doctor. This was a role that was often associated with Jews in the Ottoman Empire. And there are some very famous Jewish doctors who served the Sultan. You can see in the middle a woman uh, wearing the clothes of the era uh, of this early modern period. And then on the right, you can see a turban Jew who is a merchant Jew. And you can see he has some textiles in his arm. And um, this became one of the major ways in which the Jewish communities of the Ottoman Empire, especially the largest community, Salonika, could pay its jizya, could fulfill the obligation to pay the tax. And that was by manufacturing the uniforms for the Sultan's personal military, known as the Janissaries. And they really, one of the only acts of anti-Jewish violence that takes place in this period is in the uh, early part of the 17th century, when the quality of the uh, uniforms manufactured by the Ottoman Jews was not deemed to be of high enough caliber, and the leader of the Jewish community was brought to Istanbul and actually executed by the Sultan for his failure to live up to the expectations of the Dime and the uh, Dime and the Jizya. Okay, but that 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 is important to recognize that there were certain acts of anti-Jewish violence, but overall, that was the exception that demonstrates the rule. There were uh, very few popular uprisings against the Jews. And when there were, for example, in the 19th century, they were generally initiated by Christians and not by Muslims. And that led um, already in the 18th century to European observers being fascinated by the dynamics that were at play in the Ottoman Empire. So here we have the French philosophe and figure of the Enlightenment, Voltaire, writing in his famous essay on toleration in 1763 the following, the Sultan governs in peace, 20 million people of different religions, 200,000 Greeks live in security in Constantinople. The Mufti nominates and presents to the Sultan, the Greek patriarch, the Sultan nominates bishops for some of the Greek islands. The empire is full of Christians and Jews. The annals of Turkey do not record any revolt instigated by any of these religions. So again, you can see if you take this text, thinking about the outside observer in the figure of Voltaire, and you see the letter from the Jews of Salonika we looked at earlier from over uh, from two centuries earlier, where they're describing the Ottoman Empire as a place of welcome and security, you can see uh, this theme being consistent over the course of several centuries. So what did Jewish community look like in the context of the Ottoman Empire? We can see one of the major organizing nodes of Jewish life in the Ottoman Empire. And here I'm taking Salonika as an example because uh, this was the largest of the communities. Um, it also happens to be the, the subject of my own book and the city from which my own uh, family on my father's side comes from. So I'll give you some examples here. You can see the layers of Jewish presence accumulate in the context of this city based around the key node of social and communal organization was the kahal, the congregation. And um, so you can see here, look, it's a Chaim, this was the Romaniot congregation. This is said, according to local legend, to have operated in the first century. And when Apostle Paul went on his peregrinations throughout the Eastern Mediterranean world, he is said to have preached at this congregation in the first century. Um, the other side of that story is that he was quickly kicked out by the Jewish community who were not interested in his proselytization. But anyhow, it became an important mark and evidence of Jewish presence in the city 
going back two millennia. We see the establishment even before the Ottoman conquest of Ashkenazi, of an Ashkenazi Jewish congregation, of Jews who fled Central Europe. And then you can see Jews coming from a variety of different places in the Iberian Peninsula and also Italy that establish roots in the Ottoman Empire, specifically in Salonika. And until the 20th century, these congregations would continue to operate. There were over uh, 50 different congregations that would be operating in Salonika by the time of World War I. Okay? And you can see, of course, uh, you might, whoop, pardon me, you might say, well, why do we have Catalonia uh, Yashan, old Catalonia over here? Well, and then you have new Catalonia, Catalonia Hadash. And you can see the old and the new in many different places. Like my family were among the founders of the new, the Lisbon Hadash congregation in 1536, the Noir family. Uh, you may be familiar, at least in another language, but I'll give you the Ladino version of the following uh, aphorism or refrain, dos judios, tres keilot, two Jews, three synagogues. So there were internal divisions and differences that led to the congregations fissuring and producing new, uh, new communities. Okay. You also notice here the Mograbis uh, congregation was established in the late 16th century by Jews who came from Morocco. So you can see the wide variety of geographies, again, that constituted the layers of Salonika. And if we looked at Istanbul or we looked at other places within the Ottoman Empire, you would see similar um, dynamics of multiplicities of communities established um, uh, and with their own particular dynamics um, at play. Okay. Uh, what's also interesting is that the different congregations, um, we might call like eventually these communities would be Sephardic communities, but each of the congregations developed and preserved their own nusach, their own liturgy, essentially. And so already in the 16th century, they would be publishing their own machsorim and uh, sidurim, their own prayer books and their own high holiday prayer books that would have slight variations based on the customs of their congregation. And those distinctions and differentiations continued to exist until the 20th century, all within the framework of the Ottoman context. So what are the main institutions that constituted the kahal, constituted the congregation? And these were, you know, each kahal was sort of its own discrete universe into itself. So it had its own representative, to the sultan, its own intermediary, known as the kahya, to the, to the Ottoman authorities. It had its own keila, its own synagogue, and the apparatus associated with the synagogue and the liturgy. It would have its own Talmud Torah, its own religious school for boys only. Women's education is not introduced in a formal sense until the 19th century. It would have its own bet din, its own rabbinic court, where it would adjudicate all sorts of conflicts within the Jewish community, especially as it related to family law, like marriage and uh, and divorce and alimony, but also commercial disputes, um, interpersonal uh, conflicts, Sabbath observance. Salonika was also very interesting because it was one of the few places in the world that if you violated the laws of Shabbat, you could be put into prison. <laughs> There was a prison that was operated by the Jewish community, and it had the backing of the Ottoman authorities. Okay, so a very fascinating dynamic here. And this is a world in which, if you were a member of the Jewish community, that was essentially your political identity at the time, uh, until the 19th century. And um, you could not marry across confessional lines. Jews were with Jews, Christians were with Christians, Muslims or with Muslims, and in fact, it was illegal to convert to any religion other than Islam until the uh, 19th century. By the way, the prohibition against intermarriage, according to the Ottoman laws that uh, compelled Jews to marry Jews and Christians to marry Christians and Muslims to marry Muslims, one of the only countries in the world that still preserves that Ottoman-style law um, is actually Israel. You know, where you you know, there's no civil marriage; it's only religious marriage. That is an inheritance of the Ottoman system. Um, other countries that preserve that inheritance, like Greece, they abolished the Ottoman law related to marriage 
uh, a little bit ago, but actually not that long ago, Ottoman law continued to operate in Greece until 1982. Okay. So other institutions included the uh, the charity associations, and there would be hospitals, and there would be um, uh, institutions uh, to care for the poor. There would be neighborhoods, and then of course the betachayim, the cemetery. Now the euphemism in Hebrew to refer to the cemetery among Ladino speakers is uh, betachayim, the house of life. The idea is that once one dies, they never actually leave their community, and the cemetery became a very important space of the living. It was a place to which one would go and make ziara, make a pilgrimage at the time of the Yamim Noraim, at the time of the high holidays. It was a place where you would go to pray in times of despair. If a young woman was having difficulty to uh, getting pregnant, she would go to the tomb of a, of a hacham, of a sage, and uh, and pray there, or sometimes strap herself to the tomb and make penitential prayers with the hope that she would be rewarded with the fertility that she sought. So in addition to these formal institutions within the Kahal, there were also these other social institutions that brought people together in the broader context of the society, whether it was the hammam, whether it was the uh, the coffee house, or whether it was the tavern, um, the hammam would be a space, uh, there would be a men's space, a women's space, sometimes Jews only, sometimes Jews, Christians, and Muslims sharing the space. And the same things with the coffee house and the taverns, although these spaces were principally male spaces, but male spaces that might have moved across the boundaries between the different communities. So in addition to establishing these institutional frameworks in the formal context of the congregation and the social institutions, Jewish life in the Ottoman Empire after 1492 was very important in developing culture and religious life. And I don't mean just cultural and religious life for the Jewish communities that was relevant only to the framework of the Ottoman Empire, but actually some of the foundations of what we might even consider to be modern Judaism in general are planted in the period after 1492 in the Ottoman Empire. So one of the things that transpires with the expulsion of the Jews from Spain is actually that Jews bring with them from the Iberian Peninsula something that didn't exist in the Ottoman world at that time, which was movable type. So the first book, think about this, was the first book published in the Muslim world was a Hebrew book published in Istanbul in 1493. Okay, And the publication and development of intellectual productivity was a key aspect of Jewish life in this period, uh, in the at the end of the 15th century through um, uh, and moving forward afterwards. So, for example, one of the most famous Jewish codes of law ever created was the Shulchan Aruch. Perhaps some of you have heard of it by Yosef Caro, who was born in Spain in, in 1488 but as a child was expelled and settled in the Ottoman Empire. Um, he was in Salonika, he was in Edirne, and it was in those places, especially Salonika, which became, as I mentioned, the, the, the largest center of Jewish settlement in the Ottoman Empire at that time. And it also became home to the largest rabbinic library at the time. So when Yosef Karo uh, goes to compose this Jewish code of law in the wake of the expulsion, he's like, okay, our lives have been upended by the expulsion. Jewish life and the grandeur of medieval Spanish Jewish life has been uprooted and effaced. We need to develop new life in a new place. We need to better understand what our laws and practices and traditions are. Here are sort of the cliff notes for the Jewish public. And he presents the rulings in the Hebrew language for the literate classes to be able to access the uh, teachings of the Talmud without having to read all of the tractates of the Talmud. This text was so successful, not only in the Ottoman Empire, it was published in Italy, even though it was produced in the Ottoman Empire, and it spread from there, including to Eastern Europe, to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, where uh, Moses Isserlis 
created his own elaborations of the Shulchan Aruch that reflected not Sephardic customs, but rather Ashkenazi customs. So today, Sephardic and Ashkenazi communities, with very variations based on geography and approach, adhered to the basic principles that Yosef Karo articulated in the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century, became the foundation of what we might say is modern Jewish law. Some other fascinating developments emerge in the context of the Ottoman Empire as well. So for example, if you have been to a Friday night Shabbat service and you have heard or sung the piyut lechadodi, which welcomes the Sabbath queen at the start of Shabbat, well, that is a, uh, a composition that was created by Shalom al kabetz who was born in Salonika after his parents had been expelled from Spain in 1492. And he and Yosef Karo uh, were part of a broader circle that was based in Salonika of Kabbalists, of practitioners of Jewish mysticism. And it would be uh, Jewish mysticism and its central text, the Zohar, which was first developed in medieval Spain with the expulsion of the Jews of Spain, it would be transmitted across the Mediterranean world again, and Salonika would become an important center of Kabbalistic development. And it would be there in 1533 where uh, Al-Kabetz and Karo and some others in the Kabbalistic circles would develop the all-night ritual of praying and studying for the holiday of Shavuot. Perhaps some of you have engaged in this ritual yourself. This is developed, I mean, it has a specific point of origin, which is Shavuot 1533, Salonika, the Ottoman Empire. Now, you might be thinking, wait, hold on a second. I thought Sfat was the center of the Kabbalistic world and of Jewish mysticism. And that is true. Sfat became the place to which the practices that were developed in Salonika were transplanted in the 1530s when people like Karo and people like Shalom al-Kabetz relocate to Eretz Yisrael, to Svat, which was, again, part of the Ottoman Empire. So you can see here, again, some of the interconnectivity across the geographical spaces in the Balkans and Turkey to the region of, um, uh, of Eretz Yisrael, which in the Ottoman framework was actually part of essentially the Vilayet of Syria. Okay, so that was the that was the region there. And you can see these uh, arrows uh, moving. So, you know, right here, 1516, 1517, once the Ottomans take uh, Eretz Israel from the Mamluks, it becomes more open to the arrival and sustenance of Jewish communities as part of that broader Ottoman framework. Now, um, one of the other major dynamics that would disrupt Jewish life in the Ottoman Empire in the 17th century comes in the form of Messianism. And, you know, Messianism has many different aspects in Jewish history, um, uh, going back to, uh, to ancient times, um, to the era of Bar Kokhba, there's messianic fervor there, and even before that, to uh, to the messianic fervor surrounding Jesus. I mean, Jesus was Jewish, and there was a messianic movement that was organized around him. Now, in this period after 1492, there were a series of other major messianic movements, and uh, maybe another time we can talk about all of them. <laughs> but I want to just uh, I want to mention one briefly and focus on the other one. Uh, there was a converso. Uh, named uh, Shalom Molcho, uh, Solomon Molcho, who had been converted uh, to Christianity, came from a, a Jewish origin family that had converted to Christianity in Portugal. And he decided that the transformations that were taking place in the world, the expulsions, the persecutions were a sign that the end of days was near. And he proclaimed that he was the Messiah. And he went to the Pope in Rome and told the Pope, in Rome, that uh, the Pope is no longer in charge, but that uh, uh, Shalom Molcho is in charge. Uh, and what happened to Shalom Molcho? <laughs> he was executed. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, we have a different movement, and you can see by 
these little bands here, how wide spanning it was. This is a very famous, uh, infamous movement in Jewish history in the 17th century, and that is the movement of Shabbatai Svi. And Shabbatai Svi was an important figure, a rabbinic figure, who was from Izmir, which was an important mercantile town on the Aegean coast. Like the main towns were Salonika, Istanbul, and Izmir right here, making a kind of triangle. He was a very charismatic figure. He was a learned figure. And uh, in the context of the 17th century, there were messianic movements that were taking place not only in uh, among Jews, but also among Christians. There was millenarianism even in England, say. There was millenarianism expectations among Muslims in the Ottoman Empire. So it was an era of transformation, an era of crisis, and this is a Jewish version of it. Um, what eventually transpires is the uh, uh, Shabbatai Svi uh, develops a group of followers who believe that he is the Messiah who everyone has been waiting for, and it reaches the news of, uh, of Shabbatai Svi, reaches as far as the German-speaking lands, as far as Amsterdam, as far as London, and actually some of you may be familiar with this, the first autobiography by a Jewish woman of Gluckel of Hamelin, who's here outside in the, in the German Empire, in her autobiography, she speaks about how people in her community are packing their bags and getting ready to go to Eretz Yisrael to welcome and meet the Messiah, Shabbatai Svi. Okay, so it really created a many a uh, 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 big rupture in Jewish life all throughout Europe and the Ottoman world. The uh, main figure who promoted Shabbatai Svi's message was a like his uh, his apostle essentially. His main apostle was uh, Rav Natan. Nathan, who was based in Gaza, in uh, Eretz Israel, in Palestine, as it was known at the time, where there was a Jewish uh, a Jewish presence, an important Jewish community there, until essentially, uh, really the 1920s, um, a historic Jewish presence there. And uh, Shabbatai Svi is supported in his messianic aspirations by Nathan of Gaza. And there's a whole big story there that I cannot get into, into right now, but I want to emphasize the result of this. The result of this messianic fervor was that the Sultan had a different approach than the Pope. The Sultan brought Shabbatai Svi before him and provided Shabbatai Svi with an ultimatum, which is convert to Islam or die, face the death penalty. What did this Jewish, Sultan, uh, Jewish Messiah do? He opted to embrace Islam. So he converted to Islam, and that created another rupture among his followers, most of whom decided that this is not the path that the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, would pursue. And they abandoned him and vilified him and considered him the false, a false Messiah, yet another one of the false messiahs. There was Jesus, the false messiah. There is Shabbatai Svi, the false messiah. But there was a, an important group of his followers, especially in Salonika, who decided to follow his path to Islam, okay? And there's a whole theology that they developed about this. Uh, the, the scholar Gershom Sholem has studied this extensively, studied it extensively. But what's really fascinating is that this community of Sabbatians, of Ma'aminim, they call themselves the believers in Hebrew. They were the believers. They, they converted to Islam established their headquarters in Salonika and formed their own kind of new sect, which were, which was called in Turkish Dunme. Um, now, is that if anybody has been to like a Turkish restaurant and you've had the meat that, you know, it rotates like this and they cut the meat and like, a, you know, souflaki. Well, in Turkish, it's called doner, which is the same root as donme. It means to rotate, to turn. So this was the donme community. These were the people that turned from Jews to Muslims. It was meant in a kind of a derogatory sense. And Jews, the, the Dunme were sort of isolated from the Jewish community, although they continued to speak the Spanish-based Jewish language known as Ladino, but they integrated into their Judaism many Muslim practices. And they celebrated some Jewish holidays and also all the Muslim holidays. And they saw Shabbatai Svi as their Messiah. And they were formally recognized by the Ottoman state as as Muslims, um, so much so that after World War I, when Greece and Turkey have an exchange of populations, 
and all of the Muslims are expelled from Greece and have to go to Turkey, the Donme, the descendants of Jews who converted to Islam and married only among themselves, were counted as Muslims and were expelled from Greece in 1923. Okay. <clears throat> I want to um, conclude with two more key points for you, for your consideration. One is I want to talk a little bit about the language. And the second one is I want to talk about the place of uh, Jews within the context of Ottoman Eretz Israel, because I think these are both two important pieces for us to have in mind. What we see transpiring in the generations after the apostasy, the conversion of Shabbatai Svi, is you see the unprecedented emergence and flourishing of Ladino literature. Now, Ladino is kind of like to Sephardic Jews as Yiddish is to Ashkenazi Jews, Ladino being a language that is based in 15th and 16th century Castilian that was transported with the Jews when they were exiled from Spain and uh, rerouted in the context of the Ottoman Empire, but it is not frozen in time, and that's really important to recognize. It is written in Hebrew characters like Yiddish, and it has an important Hebrew Aramaic component in the language. Over the generations, it incorporated not only elements from Arabic, but also from Turkish and Greek, later Italian and French, all of the languages and cultures of the surrounding communities and of European prestige. The most important series of works of Ladino literature, uh, of traditional Ladino literature, we could say, um, that focused on uh, traditional Jewish knowledge, religious knowledge, is a text called Me'am Loez. Now, what's fascinating is the Me'am Loez, which was initiated by Rav Yaakov Huli, who is from Jerusalem, but born to a Salonican family and later wound up in Istanbul. Again, you can see the movement of people throughout the region, um, develops at first in 1730, and it is essentially uh, an encyclopedia that records and recounts all of the key aspects and interpretations of the Torah, of the Hebrew Bible, and it incorporates as well legends and tales from Midrash, uh, from the Talmud, uh, from rabbinic literature, and from folk tales and folklore uh, among the Jews of the Ottoman Empire, as well as their customs and practices. Okay, so, and it's organized according to, it begins with Bereshit, with uh, with Genesis, and there's a volume essentially for every book afterwards. And the style that Yaakov Huli developed was continued by his heirs and his disciples. And you can see he continued the series until 1899. Obviously, it's not one dude doing that. It's many generations of people producing commentary on different aspects of the Torah. And um, what's fascinating is the justification for why this text is required. Me'am Loez essentially means from a foreign nation, from a foreign people, is the, is the meaning of the title. So you say, well, why is an encyclopedic commentary going to be having the title from a foreign people? Isn't the Torah, isn't there, there's nothing more Jewish than the Torah, isn't there? So why is it called from a foreign people? Yaakov Huli describes in the Akdama, in the introduction to Me'am Loez, that the level of knowledge, uh, of teaching and learning among the Jews of the Ottoman Empire has been in decline. And he says that now, in the current generation, the knowledge has been decreased to such an extent that it is no longer possible for the vast majority of men, of Jewish men, to even read the Shulchan Aruch. Remember the Shulchan Aruch? That was the Jewish code of law that we saw earlier established by Yosef Karo. He says, so if the uh, Shulchan Aruch was a Hebrew language cliff notes to the Talmud, well, here is Ma'am Loez, which is going to be a Ladino cliff notes to the Hebrew cliff notes to <laughs> the Talmud, with a lot of other accoutrements associated with it. And what's fascinating, he says, I really wish Kuli says, I really wish I didn't have to write this book in Laz, in the language, uh, the vernacular, because the Spanish language is not historically the Jewish language, but it is the language that we took with ourselves when we left Spain. It is the, the base of the language that we now speak. 
So I will render for my community in a language, an idiom that they can understand all the key aspects of Jewish practice, Jewish customs that they need to live a full and complete Jewish life. And what's fascinating in the process of producing the Mayam Loez itself, the language is transformed from a language of a foreign people into a super Jewish language. It becomes the Jewish language of the Ottoman Empire that exists in a diglossic relationship with Hebrew, but it becomes a language not only of conversation, not only of the marketplace, not only of the home, not only of the kitchen, but it also becomes the language of the <clears throat> Talmud Torah, of the school. It becomes the language of Musar, of Jewish ethical literature. It becomes the language <clears throat> that the Chachamim, the rabbis in the Betin and the Rabbinic court would use to document the cases that came before them. So it becomes an all-encompassing Jewish um, language, so much so that um, other names for the language will emerge in the context of the Ottoman Empire, including Judesmo and Judeo, which refer to the language's status as a Jewish language. The Ottoman authorities referred to Ladino, this Spanish origin language, as the Jewish language, not Hebrew, but Ladino, they called Yehudija, the language of the Yodi, the language of the Jews. And so this established a very important precedent according to which Ladino would emerge as a core and defining Jewish aspect of the life of Jews in the Ottoman Empire. And it is also the language of Jews, not only in Salonika, not only in Izmir, not only in Istanbul, but also in Ottoman Palestine, in Jerusalem. How do we know how important Ladino was for the Jews of, uh, of Jerusalem? When the first missionaries come to the Ottoman Empire in the 1820s and 1830s, they go to places like Izmir and Salonika and Istanbul and Jerusalem. And you know what they, the first thing they all do, including in Jerusalem, is they learn Ladino because they want to convert the Jews. Uh, these are British and American missionaries, principally. They want to convert the Jews. They want to convert the Jews to Christianity. They want to bring them to the Holy Land and to uh, to quicken the return of, uh, of Jesus in their own theology and eschatological vision. So they recognize, okay, how we're going to communicate with the Jews? Well, we need to speak their language. And the dominant language at the time was Ladino. Now, when you think of Jerusalem today, obviously, I, again, you just got to bracket the contemporary moment for a second. It's impossible to do. I understand that. But let's just delve back, peel back some of the layers here, you know, because what's really fascinating is when you look at the history of the Jews in Jerusalem in the Ottoman times, you will see very clearly how this was one world that connected Salonika, Istanbul, Sfat, Jerusalem, Alexandria, Sarajevo, Rhodes. This was one world. How do we know it was one world? Because the Jewish community in Jerusalem, which was historically very small, contiguous presence, but a historically small um, community. For example, uh, in the uh, 16th century, Jerusalem had about 12,700 residents of whom almost 10,000 were Muslim, um, about 1,500 were Christian, and about 1,200 were uh, were Jewish. So they were the third of the three main religious groups in Jerusalem, and they were mostly people who were uh, there to study, and they were largely poor. So who was responsible for the Jewish community in Jerusalem? This is from especially the 1720s uh, through the 19th century, the Jewish community in Jerusalem was administered, not in Jerusalem, but it was administered in Istanbul, in the imperial capital. And they had a, a an organization called the Vad Pekide uh, Yerushalayim Bekushta, which is essentially the committee of officials of Jerusalem in Istanbul. And in Istanbul, the leaders of the Jewish community oversaw the finances of the Jewish community in Jerusalem. They arranged halukah, and halukah is the collection of funds from the diaspora to support Jewish life 
in the Holy Land. They helped orchestrate Ziara, the pilgrimage of Jews to Jerusalem. And, you know, if you made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you would get a special title for yourself, which is you took the same title that the Muslims took when they went to Mecca and Medina, which is Haji. So you have many Jews who take the title Haji, uh, one of the first Jews, Sephardic Jews from the Ottoman Empire, who came to the United States, for example, was a guy by the name of Haji Afraim ben Giyad. And say, why is his name Haji? What is that? So, well, because he made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Okay. It was also in Istanbul that the Sedakah, the uh, charity for the distribution of the Halukah, distribution of the funds collected to benefit the Jews of Eretz Israel, it was organized and distributed based on the leadership in uh, in Istanbul. Right now, what you're looking at is a shiviti, which is essentially a decorative textile or plaque um, that celebrates, in this instance, the omnipresence of uh, of Hashem. So there's an allusion to uh, uh, to the Book of Psalms here. I have set the Lord before me, and uh, it indicates the direction of prayer, which is toward Jerusalem. And this is from Istanbul, it, produced in Istanbul of Jerusalem in the 19th century. So you can see the very close and intimate relationships between Jewish communities across the Ottoman world. And the universe that I've been describing for you will be radically transformed, upended, and altered, especially in the 19th century with the introduction of, of European modernity, the introduction of concepts like citizenship and rights, um, with the arrival of larger numbers of Ashkenazi Jews coming from Central and Eastern Europe, with the advent of modern anti-Semitism and modern political ideologies, including Zionism and socialism and liberalism, the entire universe that I have described and all the dynamics that I have pointed to would be completely undone. And unfortunately, we don't have a time to get into the next phase of the story, but I did want to offer you a sense of how those dynamics of Jewish life in the Ottoman Empire were playing out in the first several centuries of uh, the existence of the Ottoman Empire during its heyday, during the uh, period of cultural uh, efflorescence among Jews in the Ottoman realm. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Although I, I kind of want to say we do have maybe a few minutes for the, the, the sound that you showed me earlier, because I think it was fascinating. So maybe we can have that. Sure. Do you want to, you want to hear that? Okay. Yeah. I'll give you one, one taste. Uh, let's see. Um, one of the, the things that transpires is you think about, well, how does modern citizenship impact um, Jewish life here in the Ottoman Empire. And what's fascinating is that, whoop, there we go. Okay, can you see that now? Mm -hmm. Oh no, I, I didn't do it right, I'm sorry. I gotta make sure I connect the sound, which I didn't do. Sorry, a little technical. If 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 it's a problem, we can jump into questions and then see if we oh, have I mean, here. No, I think I can I think I can do it here. Sorry. Um okay. So another thing that actually develops, some of you might be familiar with the Hanoten Teshuala Melachim, which is the prayer for the government, which is recited by many communities all across the world. Well, it was first developed in the Ottoman Empire as a way to express gratitude uh, among Jewish communities for the Sultan. And this is something else that spread to other communities. So in the United States, even you, many communities will recite a prayer for, uh, for the government. So in modern times, um, you can see this being set to, uh, to music. 
Um, and here we have some of the first, one of the first early Ottoman Jewish musicians, a guy by the name of Chaim Effendi. Um, here's a recording of his prayer for the government for the sustenance of the Sultan. I mean, it, it's really fascinating. And it's written, here is a version of it in Ladino. And what I'm going to play for you it is in Hebrew, but here's a version of it in Ladino in Hebrew script. So if you know Hebrew script, this is the Sephardic style of Hebrew script. So you may not be so familiar with these letters. Um, so for uh, a, a, a example, this is this is Hanoten Teshua en Ladino. So this is Hey Nun, right? So a little, a little bit, a little bit different. This here, this one is Aleph Yud Lamed. El que da salvación a los uh, a los reyes. Okay, so you see, this is in uh, in Ladino here. I'll play for it, and it will the the music which is the music of the Ottoman Empire, which was the music that Jews in the Ottoman Empire adopted. So anywhere you go, Jews sing their songs like their neighbors, essentially. And that's no different in the context of the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> the idea hopefully but what's fascinating in this instance here right this is what we see here is this is an honor of re sultan abdul ghazi hamid khan so this is like they give him the islamic title of warrior i mean it's just it's just it's just a fascinating you know introduction a different kind of universe and the embeddedness of jews in the ottoman empire i'll give you one more slide maybe just so you can see this in modern times is also reflected here in these Jewish wedding contracts. It's like a different universe, okay? You have Ketubot from the early 20th century, written in Hebrew, obviously, but including signs and symbols of Islam, star and crescent, star and crescent. This is a snapshot into a world that seems maybe almost impossible to have imagined once existed, but it really was. This was the dynamic at play in the Ottoman Empire. Here, you have Megillat Esther, again, with a crescent on top. You have a fascia, a Torah binder, star and crescent. So uh, it's a different dynamic than what we might expect from our own uh, lens today. But I want to show you how embedded Jewish life was in that uh, Muslim context, a world that seems very distant. Um, from us today. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, uh, this extremely fascinating, uh, you know, wide and deep <laughs> overview. I'll jump into some of the questions that uh, were asked. The first one was uh, you mentioned the moving of Jewish communities uh, around the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and there was a question if that was done by force or were there incentives or how did that happen? It's a great question. You didn't have a choice, so it was by force, but there were incentives, like, in other words, <clears throat> certain kinds of arrangements would play out so that it would be attractive for Jews to go to a different place, like, especially if they were going to be charged with building up a new urban environment that would give them certain kinds of essentially privileges to uh, to uh, to advance the development of those new uh, of those new and rebuilt uh, urban centers. And, and are there any records of these communities moving and talking about this movement? Is there kind of, yes. do we know who they are? Yes, yes. I mean, so like, for example, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the Ottoman tax registers in 1478, for example, in Salonika, indicate that there are no Jews there. 
And the question is, well, how can there be no Jews? But what? What? what but they were all the Greek-speaking Jews, and well, now we have the answer, because the Greek-speaking Jews were transferred to, uh, they were transferred to Istanbul at the time, and so that can and and Jews from Salonika were transferred to different places. Jews from Salonika were also transferred to Sarajevo. What is the memory of that? There is Salonika Street within the Jewish quarter of Sarajevo that uh, was, it no longer exists, but it was a physical marker and a memory of the movement of Jews across geography in the context of the Ottoman space. Thank you. Uh, a small question related to that. Is Salonika the historical name of today Saloniki or are those two different places? Pardon me. Yes, I should have. I should have said that. Yes. Salonika is the name that is generally used in English today, but in Hebrew, in Israel, it's called Saloniki. Uh, and in Greek, both in ancient times and today, it is called Thessaloniki. So it is the um, today it is the second biggest city in Greece after Athens. And um, from the 16th century until essentially World War I, half of the population of Salonika were Ladino-speaking Sephardic Jews who had Iberian origins. And their influence was so profound on the city that actually the entire town, including the port, closed from Friday night to Saturday night in observance of Shabbat, in observance of the Jewish Sabbath. And that was true for Muslims, Muslims Christians, and Jews, all uh, essentially observed uh, observed the Jewish Sabbath uh, in that town, and it was a space um, where Jews operated in all the different social and economic strata of the society. So it was a it was an unusual space in many ways. Um, okay, I'm just I'm, I'm I'm thanking you and jumping to the next sure, question sure, because yeah. more of them are coming in. Um, is Me'am Loez still widely used by Sephardic Jews, or has it kind of uh, gone into the background? It, uh, it depends on how generous of the term widely, hmm. uh, how, you know, it is still used. Um, you can take uh, a weekly class online via the Sephardic Brotherhood of America in New York. One of my friends and colleagues here in Seattle, Al Maiman, uh, leads a weekly class on Ma'am Loez. There are also a Hebrew translation of Ma'am Loez um, and a... Uh, also a, uh, a an English adaptation of Mamloez that you can access. So it is still informs many of the practices of traditional Sephardic communities, um, even though uh, it is not as widely uh, accessed today. But like <clears throat> in the 19th century, if you were a Jewish family and if you had a book or two, the first book you would likely have would be one of the editions of Mamloez. And actually the image of the Mamloez that I showed was my own great grandfather's uh, edition of Bereshi. He was a rabbi in the in Ottoman uh, Saloniki and subsequently in in the United States, and that was one of the books that was transmitted to me from his uh, from his library. Um, another question regarding language: Judeo Arabic. If uh, Jews from Iraq and that area were part of the Ottoman Empire, were they incorporated? Like, what was the relationship between Ladino and the Judeo Arabic language? Excellent question. So the Judeo, Judeo Arabic, and uh, and Ladino were two separate, you know, languages, and we could say sort of distinct cultural universes. There was overlap and movement between these worlds, which intersected most dramatically in places like Eretz Israel and Egypt, where you would have Ladino speaking and Arabic speaking Jews and Yiddish speaking Jews converging in those uh, in those spaces. And there, I guess you could say there was also a certain sense of competition between the Arabic speaking Jews and the Ladino speaking Jews, and also certain kinds of internal hierarchies that would be adopted from Western Europe. You know, if 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 European societies were to see the Balkans as a backwards place, the people in the Balkans would then see the people further to the east as even backwards than them. So the, so there would be a certain kind of hierarchy that would be established within the Jewish communities that would be bridged um, largely by the rabbinic classes and by merchants who would be most likely to be moving between these different spaces. So like even, I think it's in uh, Aleppo, in Halep, in the 17th century, one of the rabbis there writes uh, in recognition of the importance of the teaching and learning 
of the Chachamim, of the rabbis of Saloniki, they write Mi Saloniki Titze Torah, which is normally Mi Sion Titze Torah, from, uh, from, uh, from Zion will come forth the law, will come forth learning of the Torah. They say, actually, in our day, the learning comes forth from Saloniki, from Salonika, because it was the main rabbinic center of the Mediterranean world. And if you went to the uh, the rabbinic academies of Salonika, uh, from there you would get posts all, all over the place, uh, all throughout the Middle Eastern and Mediterranean world, even the European world. So rabbis from Saloniki wound up in Amsterdam. They wound up in Curacao in the in the Caribbean in the early modern period. So it was really an important uh, an important center and shows the interconnectivity between those worlds. Okay, I'm I'm just going to use every minute for a few more questions. Um, were there family names that were assigned to Jews based on their communities or regions or places, and did that carry on? Like, can we identify them that way? Excellent question. So you know, many of the Sephardim have surnames. Alcunas in Ladino that go back to medieval Spain. Uh, so, like my name, for example, Naar, which is Hebrew, Nun Ayn Reish, this is a name that exists uh, before 1492 in Spain. And there are many other names like that that have uh, medieval Spanish, uh, uh, medieval origins from the Iberian Peninsula. Like my professorship is the Al Hadef professorship. This is an Arabic name, an Arabic surname that comes from the period of Muslim rule in Spain, and that uh, continues until today. So unlike Ashkenazi Jews, for example, which don't really, don't get surnames until the Napoleonic era, really until the 19th century, many of the Sephardim have long-standing um, long surnames that you can associate both with certain places of origin, like in Spain. So for example, uh, there is a family we have here in Seattle de Jaén, or uh, which the, the legend of the family is that family comes from Jaén, today's Jaén in, uh, in Spain. Um, there are other family names that you can associate with places to which the Jews settled after 1492. So for example, Nar is a name that is specifically associated with Salonika. Al-Hadef is a name that is specifically associated with Rhodes. Uh, Al-Taras is a surname that is specifically associated with the area around in in Thrace, in the area around Rodosto. And so you give me a surname, I can give you a little bit about the history of it. Um, because you are right, whoever asked the question, that the surname, with some exceptions, Cohen, I cannot help you with Cohen. Cohen is uh, not geographically related, or other names like Bahar, uh, which exist in all the different communities. I cannot uh, isolate those, but many of the names do have their own histories that track on to different geographies. So I'm going to try, I'm going to uh, try uh, putting two questions together and it's also possibly outside. I mean, it's more towards the art realm, but you seem to, your knowledge seems to be endless. So we're <laughs> just going to try. Um, first of all, there's a question about what types of textiles uh, did Jews use and the merchants and where did they get the dyes from? And I'll just slip into that. The other question, if the crescent was uh, thought of when incorporated in Jewish art, was it thought of as a national symbol or a religious symbol? Excellent question. So yeah, in terms here, of, I have uh, very good questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, in terms of the, uh, the art and the tapestries, there's a really good book by uh, Esther Juhas on, uh, published by the Jewish Museum of Israel on the material culture of the Jews in the Ottoman Empire. And there she gives a lot of the details and a lot of wonderful images, both around the clothing and around the textiles, around the parochet, for example, for the, uh, the Sefer Torah and about Rimonim uh, and, and different kinds of things like that. They oftentimes drew uh, inspiration from the local environment, whether it was the the foliage, like we saw in the Ketubot, or the symbols. So you have uh, uh, some uh, covers for the Torah that have actually imagery of mosques on them, for example, that are stitched on there. Um, I don't know the particular origin of the how they would get the dyes, um, but I, I, I suspect that uh, in this book I mentioned, they would have some of the answers. And the uh, the second question was, sorry, about the, oh, the symbols. Uh, it's a great question. And we don't know the example as to whether the inclusion of the star and crescent was a political or a religious um, statement. 
I would infer that it was more a political one than a religious one. The star and crescent became the symbol of the Ottoman Empire and adorned, adorned on the Ottoman flag when it was established in 1844. So after that time, you start to see the star and crescent uh, appear more broadly in Ottoman civic life and in public spaces. Um, and then it becomes incorporated into the uh, into the iconography uh, used in Jewish uh, in Jewish artifacts um, like the ones that I showed you. So I would suggest it is more of a political orientation. It's not a suggestion of uh, you know that they have become Muslims or something like that. Not not at all. It's about recognizing their connection and fealty to the Ottoman context, which is you know. You can see in terms of the Judaica stuff, like in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, you can see Hanukkiahs with the eagle, which was the symbol of the uh, of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, same kind of thing. Jews sort of ingratiating themselves to the powers that be, both an expression of fealty and also say, just in case you think we're not loyal here, let me show you how loyal we are.